Buenos días a todos. Gracias por haber venido esta mañana al encuentro de Bibliotecas Públicas y Maker Spaces. En primer lugar, quiero hacer una ronda de agradecimientos. Eh, en, primero a la Embajada de Estados Unidos por habernos hecho el ofrecimiento de poder contar hoy con CJ Linz, de, el responsable del Tecnolab de la Biblioteca Central de Cleveland. Muchas gracias, Linz, por estar aquí hoy con nosotros y haber aceptado la invitación para esta jornada. También quiero dar las gracias a Medialab Prado, a Marcos García y su equipo, que aceptaron rápidamente la invitación para colaborar juntos en, con el Ministerio de Educación, Cultura y Deporte en la organización de esta jornada. Y eh, dar las gracias a todos los expertos que están en esta mesa central, a modo de última cena, decían por aquí, <risa> por haber aceptado también la invitación del Ministerio. Y a Joaquín Rodríguez, experto en cultura digital y que va a ser el responsable de moderar este coloquio que habrá después de la presentación de Lins. Quiero también dar las gracias a mi equipo, al equipo de la subdirección, a Susana Alegre y a Diego Gracia, que han hecho posible que hoy estemos también todos aquí y podamos debatir y reflexionar en torno a las bibliotecas públicas o las bibliotecas en general como espacios de creación. Eh, la idea de poder organizar esta jornada, aparte de por el ofrecimiento de la Embajada de Estados Unidos, también tiene su origen en el octavo Congreso Nacional de Bibliotecas Públicas que celebramos en noviembre de 2016 en Toledo y donde eh, planteábamos el tema de la transformación del espacio digital y el espacio físico de las bibliotecas. Ahí hubo varios talleres, dos de ellos dedicados al tema de las bibliotecas como espacios de creación, y a raíz de esto y del interés que suscitó en el Congreso y el debate sobre estos temas, pensamos que era conveniente organizar, o apropiado, o interesante, oportuno, organizar una jornada de este tipo, pero ya abierta también a otros tipos de bibliotecas. Por eso, entre los expertos que nos acompañan en el coloquio de hoy, hay también eh, profesionales de bibliotecas universitarias, de bibliotecas nacionales, de bibliotecas públicas eh, hoy, y de bibliotecas escolares y especializadas. Además del de resto de expertos, de profesionales que trabajan en laboratorios de creación, en otros ámbitos y otros espacios de la ciudad. Entonces, eh, con ese punto de partida, esperamos que el debate y el coloquio de esta mañana sea intenso, fructífero, que dé lugar a la propuesta y a la puesta en marcha de proyectos en colaboración entre todos nosotros, no solo entre las bibliotecas, sino entre otros agentes que trabajan en la ciudad u otros sectores, eh, por parte de las bibliotecas tenemos la riqueza de los contenidos. En los últimos años las bibliotecas han trabajado en crear y consolidar su identidad digital a través de servicios digitales, a través de la difusión de esos servicios por las redes sociales y a través de la creación y puesta a disposición de todo el mundo de una inmensa cantidad de contenidos digitales preparados y disponibles para su reutilización. Entonces, creo que eso es un punto de partida y un ofrecimiento de las bibliotecas para todos aquellos ciudadanos y sectores que quieran participar en la creación de nuevos contenidos y en la transformación de todo ese conocimiento que se ha ido generando a lo largo de los años y que se seguirá generando de otras maneras y segmentado para distintos públicos o audiencias. No quiero extenderme mucho más, eh, voy a dar la palabra a Marcos García y sí quería mencionar que a raíz de este encuentro nos gustaría crear un espacio en la web del Ministerio donde podamos subir experiencias y buenas prácticas de puesta en marcha de proyectos de este tipo de los que vamos a hablar esta mañana. Así que muchas gracias y feliz eh, y fructífero día. Hasta luego. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias Concha. También quería agradecer a Susana y a Diego que pensaran que, bueno, Medialab Prado era un buen lugar para celebrar esta, esta jornada, ¿no? Eh, un, un, un lugar para pensar eh, otros modelos de, de institución cultural. Creo que las, no, no solo las bibliotecas están repensando, también los museos, los archivos, la escuela, la universidad. Y creo que en todos los casos coinciden... Eh, eh, pues muchos aspectos ¿no? que luego bueno, mencionaré en la presentación. Quería agradeceros a todos que hayáis venido y, y deciros que, bueno, que esperamos que sea una, una buena sesión. Y, y nada, ya directamente yo creo que le, le paso la palabra a... ¿O vas a presentar tú? ¿Eh? ¿Lo hago yo? 
Nada, eh, pues paso a presentar a, a, a CJ Lines eh, de la Biblioteca Pública de, de Cleveland, donde llevan, tienen una experiencia muy interesante ya desde hace ya más de cuatro años o cinco años en, en pensar otros formatos, otro modelo de, de biblioteca en la que los usuarios eh, puedan realmente hacer proyectos. Así que muchas gracias. Gracias. Buenos días, good morning. Um, again, my name is CJ. I am from the Cleveland Public Library. Um, I, I wanted to first thank uh, Media Lab Prado and the U.S. Embassy for um, allowing me to come to Spain this week um, and share my experiences and um, to speak to everyone today. Um, so this is a, a, I wanted to give a very brief overview of um, my experience and our experience in Cleveland um, regarding makerspaces in public libraries. So I want to talk a little, um, share a little bit of information about Cleveland. Um, Cleveland is located in the northeast region of um, the United States. We border right along Lake Erie, one of the Great Lakes um, in our region. We have about 388,000 patrons and cover about 200 or so um, square kilometers. Um, we serve a larger region um, called Cuyahoga County, which has 1.2 million um, users and covers a little less than 1,200 square kilometers. Most of our patrons do come from Cleveland. Um, Cleveland was um, uh, founded in the late um, 1700s, 1796, I believe. Um, and so we have a long history of manufacturing within the city. Um, we were built along the Cuyahoga River, which helped bring um, um, uh, raw materials, um, which were used in steel mills in Cleveland, um, for as long as our uh, as long as our city has been around. Um, that said, in the 1960s, um, Cleveland's economy took a, a large hit, a large downturn, and for about 30 years, we lost a lot of our our population. We um, our population started fleeing. We lost a lot of our economy. We lost a lot of our businesses. Um, and so since that point, um, Cleveland has a, ha has a lot of poverty. Cleveland has a lot of needs within our community. Um, and the patrons who we primarily serve are uh, see the library as a resource for a lot of different things, be it um, a place to go for information and to learn about a topic, or a place to get food. We serve a lot of food for children who don't have stable, uh, a stable source of food. The library is that community center for most of our population. Um, since the 1990s, Cleveland has begun a revitalization, but we still have a lot of areas that, um, that a, a lot of um, uh, deficits within the city that um, the library has positioned itself to help out with. So um, a little bit about the Cleveland Library. We were established in 1869. We have two main library buildings, um, a classic 1925 building and a more modern 1997 building, which is currently under renovation. Um, we have about 332 patrons that we serve, an or uh, individual patrons that we serve annually. We have over 10 million items, um, and these are uh, classic items as well as audiovisual items. We have a lot of shelving, about 100 kilometers of shelving. Um, so we do a lot of traditional library services. But our technology services, we have about 625 computers, and about 650 staff members are needed to staff the entire system, which includes 27 branch libraries. For the United States, 27 branch libraries for our population is a lot of branches. But we, uh, most of our patrons are walking to our branches or cannot, uh, are situated within their own neighborhood. So we have a branch within um, about one and a half kilometers of every single patron in the city. We know a lot of our patrons don't like to travel out or are unable to travel out, so we serve them where they are instead of asking them to always come to main library or something like that. We see ourselves as the people's university. We have a lot of great education institutions in Cleveland, but some of those institutions aren't obtainable for, our, for some of our patrons. Um, uh, about 22% of our patrons do not have, have not completed in high school. They do not have a high school diploma. And only about 46% of our patrons have had the opportunity to attend college, even if it was just for one semester. So we see ourselves as the People's University. We will provide the resources for anybody to come in and learn just about anything. It will be informal. 
and they do have to, uh, there are a lot of situations where they're going to be learning on their own or we will provide them information for them to study. But that's where we see ourselves in the community, as the people's university, a place where anybody can come and learn anything, no matter what their, um, their um, uh, socioeconomic status or what their ability is. So with that in mind, um, in 2012, about five years ago, we decided we wanted to improve the technology services within our library. Um, we consolidated all of our technology into one area called Tech Central. So this space has about 90 computers. Um, we have adaptive technology stations for patrons with disabilities. We have um, a variety of group workstations, plenty of power outlet, a very traditional modern computer center. However, we didn't want it to just be a computer center, a place where people came and accessed computers and internet. We wanted it to be a creation space. We wanted it to be an innovative space where people could come and learn about innovative technologies that they may have heard about or maybe they didn't and they wouldn't normally have access to um, within the city. So one of our first investments was a 3D printer. We purchased it to share, to educate our population and then we opened it up for allowing people to print things that they've requested. One of the unique things about this space is that when we staffed this space, we didn't hire standard computer monitors, computer lab monitors. We hired staff from throughout the system. These were library assistants, paraprofessionals, that had a solid understanding of technology services. And they also had experience teaching groups of people on technology. So we brought them all to this one central space and we modeled this space as a classroom of sorts. Every single interaction our staff has with a patron is a learning opportunity. We use the saying, we won't do anything for you, but we will teach you to do anything. So we want patrons who come into this space, we will take a little longer with the patrons than I think is traditional, and we will teach them how to use the technology, why the technology works the way it does, and how to remember to use the technology in the future. We want to empower our patrons within this space. A year and a half later, we wanted to take the next step. So we opened our Tech Central Makerspace. This was a fabrication lab. It was the first fabrication lab in a public library um, in Ohio and one of the first in the country. It contained things like laser engravers, um, uh, vinyl cutters, 3D printers, we had musical instruments that we provided for our patrons. Um, also, we provided professional software, Adobe Creative Suite, Corel Draw Graphics Suite. These were all things that um, were either innovative or very common in um, fabrication and manufacturing, which again is very important within the city, that we knew our patrons didn't necessarily have access to. And we put it, the, our goals for the space were to teach people about these technologies, allow them to learn, teach them how to use these technologies. We wanted to allow a place for people who knew these technologies, who were able to use them already, a place for them to access this technology. We also wanted a place that encouraged creativity and collaboration and partnerships. These were all fundamental to makerspaces as we know them now. The, um, the one challenge that we found with our space was, well, it, it was a benefit. We drew a lot of people into the library that had never been through the doors of a library, um, especially ours. They were intrigued by this, and once they got in, in here, they understood what our mission was, and they started using other services. They would come down and use our space and then go upstairs and, and find a book on woodworking or um, manufacturing or laser engraving or 3D printing. So, or 3D printings. So they started expanding through the library. One of the challenges that we found was that our traditional patrons, the patrons that came into our computer center every day, were very intimidated by the thought of making and fabrication and creation. So we needed a way to, to help bridge that gap, to help encourage them and show them that they were creative too. Everybody is a creative being. We want to encourage them and help them make that transition from traditional technology to maker spaces like this, fabrication spaces. So we started maker programming. We call them maker labs. 
And what these are, um, they're hour to hour and a half long topics that focus on one aspect of creation. So several of our programs surround art and creation of art, drawing sketchbook drawings, create, uh, doing photography editing, um, creating spiral art, very simple and easy to use things that anybody can do. And we, we help to show them that um, the technology was not intimidating, it was just understanding how to go about the process. We do coding classes. We teach people the fundamentals of coding and how to create things like games or applications. We do classes on 3D modeling um, and 3D design. We do a lot of classes on music as well. Within Cleveland, music is very important within our city. It's, um, it's a very important cultural aspect. And so we showed people on how to take the music that they love and generate it or remix it or um, uh, um, create music and music videos, potentially. So what we found with this programming is it inspired people. It inspired people to, um, once they got that first taste of, I made this, that excitement that they were creative too, it expanded. They took a couple programs and then they started coming to our makerspace and they learned the equipment and then they created things. We saw this growing and the, the results of this were, were quite amazing. I want to take a moment to talk about a little bit of the aspects of um, makerspaces within our own space and also within other libraries in the US. Um, fabrication is one of the primary focuses of the Tech Central makerspace. We, again, we have things like laser engravers, 3D printers, vinyl cutters, other spaces. Um, my hometown library has a CNC machine, a, computer, a computerized router. These are very, um, quite honestly, these are very expensive spaces to establish. Um, the equipment is very pricey. Maintenance of the equipment sometimes can, can be a challenge. Um, but these are also very popular spaces, especially in areas where manufacturing and physical creation of items is important and is a, is a cultural background. It's also a very dirty space. It's a very loud space. So having a dedicated space for this is important, but that's kind of difficult in a lot of libraries when you're crunched for space, you're crunched for resources. Recording and production is another very popular space in the U.S., this can range from very small spaces, having one computer with a microphone or maybe a musical instrument or two, to having a very elaborate um, recording and production studio with mixer boards and um, 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 different sound processors and things like that. So you can become very small, you can become very large. But again, um, music <laughs> I think is a commonality throughout um, the world even. Um, that a lot of people identify with and can be that gateway to creation. One of the things that we do specifically in Tech Central we thought was very important was purchasing the musical instruments and providing them for our patrons. That way they didn't have to carry musical instruments, but a lot of our patrons we found did not have access to those musical instruments. So we wanted to make sure that we provided that and bridged that gap and took down that barrier for them to come in and create. Coding and design. This is a very easy space to set up. You just need a computer or even a tablet. You can teach the basics of coding. You can, um, with free, so there is a lot of free software and a lot of free resources. All of the coding we do is based on free resources we have found on the internet. We're able to take that and provide that to our patrons in a structured class or allow them to come in and use our computers to create applications, to develop websites. Um, doing things like hackathons where you bring people together and allow them to work on computers, whether it's coding or sifting through data or manipulating data for civic good. We do mapping programs to help improve the maps in the city of Cleveland. Electronics and robotics. We teach a summer robotics camp every year for middle school and high school students that allows them to come in and teach them how to build a robot, how to program a robot, and then has teams um, work against each other to, to complete a task the fastest. There's a lot of excitement about that. Um, electronics. There are very small circuit boards called Arduino or Raspberry Pi that cost about 20 euros. Um, a lot of add-ons that you can put in there. 
Um, you can have specific classes or you can leave these out for patrons and they will come in and experiment and start to create. Classes are a great way to teach them the basics, but then leaving them out allows them the freedom to create uh, kind of on their own terms. And then sewing, knitting, and fabrics. I see uh, uh, um, some of that um, surrounding the space here. These are very traditional ways of being creative. And, I'll, and one of the things we found when we first opened our makerspace is we weren't thinking of these things as creativity, as making. But they very much are. We, f um, we purchased two sewing machines for our patrons. A lot of our patrons didn't have sewing machines in it anymore. I was personally taught to sew when I was in elementary school on a sewing machine. But a lot of our youth are not taught to sew anymore. So we teach classes for youth on sewing, doing minor repairs, hemming, but also clothing creation. And for our adults, we do the exact same thing. Many of our adults were excited the fact that we had a sewing machine that they can come in and fix clothing, reuse clothing, instead of just throwing it out and buying something new. Um, we also do knitting and other fabrics programs. We have one program that, a lot, or that teaches people to knit hats and scarves, and then we take all those and donate them to well, area homeless shelters and um, charity organizations so they can be, recycled, or so they can be um, uh, given to people who need them. And then finally, this was our biggest hurdle, is our makerspace was located in our downtown library. We did programs throughout all of our 27 branches However, the patrons that wanted to use the fabrication equipment, the 3D printer, needed to travel. In a lot of cases, they couldn't travel. So we invested in a mobile makerspace. It's a very small van, not much larger than, than your five or six person taxis. Um, and we have special um, furniture that allows us to roll up a laser engraver and a 3D printer in the back and take it anywhere in the community. Set it up in a school, in a community organization. In, um, uh, in a park, um, as long as we have power, we can set this up and enable people to come in and use. Um, it really took down that barrier. We found that it was very important for our patrons to provide them access where they are, when they are, instead of asking them to come to us. So, um, a, a little difficult to read on the screen, I, I'll read it. Um, a quote from American Educator, we need technology in every classroom and in every student and every teacher's hands. Um, it is the pen and paper of our time. It is the lens through which we experience much of our world. This is the same idea that we, um, we think of in libraries. We need to enable access to this technology, to these, this equipment, to this experience for all of our patrons because the world in which we live in is experienced so much through technology. Without that, there is that digital divide. The digital divide is not just about internet access and cell phone access. It's about experiencing technology and being able to understand it and use it in everyday life. So what for our library, what used to be books on the shelf and large reference volumes that we spend thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on, that information is now available for free elsewhere. So we've taken that money for those tools for learning and translated it into tools for learning through equipment, through 3D printers, through fabrication equipment, and through programming. So we're still providing tools for learning, it's just in a different format. Equal access to technology, um, technology education, creative thinking and problem solving skills. These are all things that come from making. What we've seen is entrepreneurship. We've seen businesses created from our space. We encourage businesses to come in and run from our space. We have two t-shirt businesses that are in every day creating t-shirts and selling those to help improve themselves. Civic engagement, self-directed learning, and also mentorship and collaboration. This idea of exchanging information, but not only from a, or from a teacher to a student, but also that time when the student now becomes the teacher and information is free flowing in both directions. Since, we're, since uh, we're on a little bit of a time budget, I just want to leave us with this thought that makerspaces are collaborative learning environments where people come together to share materials and learn new skills. Makerspaces are not necessarily born out of a specific set of tools or materials, but rather a mindset of community partnership collaboration, and creation. 
And I want to say um, from my city in Cleveland to yours here in Madrid and across Spain, thank you. Muchas gracias.